where can I find good stocks? That's a question we get asked quite often. And the answer is that it's pretty easy to find good stocks, and oftentimes they're in places you wouldn't think to look. So for whatever reason, retail investors seem hell-bent on finding some diamond in the rough. So they believe there's some perfect stock out there, and to try to find it, they'll ask for stock tips, or perhaps they'll settle on some stock and try to cram that sacred cow down everyone's throat. The truth of the matter is that finding good stocks is very easy. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. And it's not by looking at small stocks with great stories. So that's the small stocks are cheaper fallacy, and that's not the case. And when we out these stories for what they are, investors will often say, well, what are good stocks? And the answer is that you shouldn't poke around in the trash looking for scraps when there's a restaurant right around the corner. So we're going to show you how to find some good stocks. And when you think about Passive investing versus active investing. This is the idea that an active manager, somebody who promises you that they can beat the market, can't. Only 5% in the long term are able. So when you start messing with your portfolio, typically that will start to erode returns. They'll say that a portfolio is like a bar of soap. The more you handle it, the smaller it gets. And there's the other saying, you know, want a, want a quick way to reduce portfolio volatility? We'll stop looking at it. So one reason passive investments outperform is because they're rules-based. So to find good stocks, to remove the human emotion element, we need a set of simple rules. This is much easier for established companies. So I wanted to point you to this book by Warren Buffett that a number of people on our Discord server are reading, and it refers to companies with a durable competitive advantage that are actually kind of equity bonds with an expanding coupon or interest rate. So this points to the problem of fixed income, which is that, in fact, it's fixed. So Buffett's expanding coupon refers to dividend growth, the idea that a company has not only paid a dividend to their investors consistently over time, but they've grown that dividend. So if a company is able to do that for 25 years or more, they're called a champion. They're also called an aristocrat. That's S&P Global Branding. So those two terms are uh, same, same, but different, as they say. Uh, an increase of 50 years or more, that's referred to as a dividend king. And there are about 50 or so companies that have managed to do that. Now, there are probably around 130 U.S. stocks that fit the champion's bill. And we have created that universe and filtered on size to get 80 stocks. And when we look at that universe, we see that over time, the average company in that 80 stock universe has increased their dividend for 47 years in a row. So that's through 10 market crashes. Imagine getting a pay raise every year for 47 years in a row. And this timeline shows you how remarkable that feat is. So if we consider that universe of 80 great stocks as a um, a starting point to build a portfolio from, then we can start to uh, separate those into industries. And there are, according to the global industry classification standard, there are 11 industries. And you might say, well, why is there only 10 listed here? Good question, because the communication services industry doesn't have any companies that have increased their dividend in a, for 25 years in a row or more. And you can think of the telecoms running into problems, right? That's, what, that's why AT&T used to be one representation of that sector, but they lost their dividend champion status because they stopped increasing their dividend. I've also X'd out real estate because... A lot of investors won't want to include REITs in their portfolio because those are non-qualified dividends, and we've uh, published a piece on that. Now, some sectors here are going to get more attention than others. For example, consumer staples. But today we're going to talk about what's probably the least discussed sector among all of these, which is materials. Now, you can see that here, the S&P 500 sector weights, of course, information technology is the largest at 26%. That should be no surprise. But look at what the smallest is. And sure, this data is from a while ago, but these relative weightings are probably very similar today. The smallest of the sector weights is materials. So those are probably some of the least talked about names. And when we look at the top 10 stocks in the materials index, we see that 
they account for nearly 70% of the total weight. At the top, there's Lynn, then you have Ecolab, Air Products, and Chemicals. But what's more notable here is that of the top 10 stocks in the S&P 500 Materials Index, five are dividend champions. That means they've not only paid, but increased a dividend for 25 years in a row or more. Now, when we look at what they do, this is a great breakdown from S&P, and it shows the GICs classification for these two fir- or these five firms, and you can read down the list here. So the, the, the naming scheme is quite clever. Uh, it just goes down right uh, through industry group, industry, and sub-industry. And uh, these are classified as industrial gases and specialty chemicals, and you can see here that these two sub-industries account for over 55% of the uh, total weight of the S&P 500 materials index. And you can see some of the other weightings listed here. And this also shows us 10-year annualized return. And the 10-year return of the S&P 500 over this time frame was 13%. And you can see that these two sub-industries have marginally outperformed that. Well, you can see how metals and mining hasn't done so well. But you also need to consider two things. One, that 10 years is the absolute minimum you ought to consider when looking at performance. Ideally, you go back as far as possible. And second, that correlations are important. So you can see the correlations of the materials sector against other sectors, and that's what helps create uh, diversification within your portfolio. So now what we can do is we can say, all right, let's take all the dividend champions in materials, and then let's rank them based on how attractive they are Are you attracted to me? for the likelihood of increasing their dividends over time. So we've done that here. This is our proprietary methodology called Quantigence, and it considers seven factors. Years increasing dividends, market cap yield, payout ratio, international sales, and five and 10 year dividend growth. And the end result is a Q score, and then we can rank them. So we have PPG, APD, Lin, RPM, and SHW. Now, what we're going to do next is focus in on two names, APD and Lin. These belong to the industrial gases sub-industry, and you can see we've stated their yields here. So, Air Product and Chemicals has a a decent yield there of about 3%, Lind only 1.18%. Then the other three companies, we've separated those out into their sub-industry, which is specialty chemicals. And you've got PPG with a yield of 1.83%. So if you're building a larger portfolio and you're looking to choose a couple stocks per sector, you may want to choose one per sub-industry. That's what we've done. Now, when you look at yields, you want to consider dividend growth. So we've spelled that out here. In other words, APD may have a much higher yield today, but if it's growing at a lower rate than Lind, then Lind will eventually catch up to it. And as you can see here, at least when we're looking at the 10-year basis, that uh, Lin isn't growing as fast. So air products and chemicals will continue increasing what they call the yield on cost over time, and you'll generate more income with that particular asset. You can see the other companies here have that number spelled out as well. Now, when we think about dividend increases over time, this is a great, uh, two great charts to look at here. The one on the left shows us uh, APD's adjusted earnings per share over time. So over the past decade, their earnings per share is growing at 11% compound annual growth rate. Well, their dividend is growing at 9% compound annual growth rate. So that's handily beating out inflation, right? But what's notable is that their dividend is growing slower than earnings per share, which means that the what they call the payout ratio is decreasing over time and you're getting more of a buffer there so that when the company runs into problems, they have plenty of buffer and they can continue that track record, continue giving you increases as they turn the ship around. And you can see that Air Products, we sent an alert to our paying subscribers on this, recently disappointed the market. I am very disappointed. Which seems to present a buying opportunity as they uh, decreased the growth rate of their dividend as they look to make sure they're um, increasing earnings per share at a rate that justifies that dividend increase. What you don't want to see 
is a dividend increase that's outpacing the increase of earnings per share because that means that eventually you're going to have to pull back on that dividend increase. Now, it's worth noting here for Lynn that they're showing us 20 years. So that's fairly remarkable. A 13% compound annual growth rate of their dividend over 20 years compared to a 12% compound annual growth rate for earnings per share. So the other thing to note about Lind here is their yields. You might say, well, I'm just going to wait until Lind's share price dips enough to where their yield goes above 2%. Well, it doesn't appear that the trend is in your favor because the last time it bumped up over 2% was when the market had its little crash over the Rona. But since then, it's been trading well below 2%. Looks like nothing more than 1.5%. So when you're selecting champions from this list, then you would use your own unique criteria. And in our case, we believe that air products and chemicals at this point in time presents a better opportunity for income than Lynn for the reasons we've talked about today. Now that brings us to the next set to choose from, the painting and coatings company. So PPG, RPM, and Sherwin-Williams, SHW. Anybody that lives in the States probably is familiar with that paint company. And if we're going to choose one of these, I think the focus here, aside from the Q score being notably higher for PPG, is international sales. And you can see that PPG has two points more than RPM on international sales. And that's because we place at a very high value companies that are diversified outside the United States. That's because you never want to have country concentration risk, what they call domestic bias when you're investing. And Sherwin-Williams here is actually penalized because they have less than 20% of their international sales coming from outside the United States. And it's actually, they're quite vague on that number, but based on the research that we've done, it appears to be less than 20%. And when you look at the materials sector, it's actually known for having low U.S. revenue exposure. You can see here when compared to the S&P 500 that it's only exposed to the U.S. by 47%. So we would expect these companies to give us some great international exposure. And for that reason, we'd drop Sherwin off the list because of their low international exposure. And we would stick with PPG, which is what we have done uh, based on their strong international exposure. So just some takeaways Set a simple objective rule that defines what a good stock is. So for us, that's dividend increases over time. And those records then become um, things that companies want to retain at all costs. Uh, apply your rule then across all sectors, not just the sexy ones. An example we've given you today of materials, there's some good companies to be found there that are probably often overlooked. Identify a pool of good stocks to choose from. Uh, select good stocks based on your unique needs. So what's best, of course, is going to change over time. And that's why you, you decide on what stocks you want and you hold them until those dividend increases stop. It's very simple. It's a very simple strategy in terms of selection and when going back to that comment about a bar of soap, there's only one reason you take action. That's if a company stops increasing their dividend. And after a few decades, you're going to be quite surprised what you've managed to accomplish in terms of not only that income that's coming in that's growing at you know, 9% every year, but also you haven't even touched your capital. And you'll be very surprised what that total return looks like. So I'm going to put up another video here that looks at finding tech dividend stocks, which is rather interesting. Uh, before you watch that, please click the like button on this video. Subscribe to our channel. Thanks so much for taking the time to watch this today.